checking Ian, are we nearly ready to start? Or yeah, ready. We're ready. Oh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship, and uh, good morning to those who are joining us on Zoom this morning. Um, at least you're all able to get onto Zoom this morning, unlike last week with the technical issues that we had. Um, and just it's it's really great to see everybody here. We are fewer in number because it's that sort of season, uh, isn't it? At the moment, uh, everyone's on holiday. Um, and if you've been like me. Um, I hope you had a happy time and if you're going to go soon, likewise. We come this morning to worship God, to learn more about him and learn more about him as we have been doing over the last three weeks in looking at in a bit more detail some of the names of God in the Old Testament. Uh, and um, I am doing concluding this short season um, of names of God, but it's something that we felt is successful and, and, and has been productive and people found it valuable. Um, so it's something that we will pick up again um, later on at other times and, and uh, extend learning about the names of God. So our opening words come from Psalm 34 and the words towards the end give us a hint about of what it is, uh, Jehovah or Yahweh Sebiot. I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a God. He surrounds and defends all who fear him and see that the Lord is good, and oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Over to Hannah and to Ian, who will lead us in our sun worship. Let's stand to sing.
and you have been with us every step of the way in our love and we give you all praise and all glory for your everlasting love and your faithfulness. Praise you, Jesus.
our worship of the Lord Almighty. As we meet with him in prayer, and I invite you to also pray your prayers, praise and adoration to the Lord <coughs> God Almighty. Lord God, we do indeed bow down before you. The Lord God Almighty, God everlasting, God in time, God out of time, God present everywhere, within us and in the entire universe, all at the same time. Our minds are completely overwhelmed by your majesty and your glory and who you are. We find at times words are just not sufficient to express our praise of you, and our worship of you, our God and our Saviour. Father, you are that same God, powerful, creative, majestic, holy. Yet you love each one of us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. If only we would believe in you and repent and turn back to you. And for those who have done that, you give us the right, the right to become your children, to be seen as perfect because we are covered with the blood of the Lamb who was slain on our behalf. That is just such an awesome and amazing thing. And we stand in awe and wonder and gratitude and thankfulness for all that you are and all that you have done, for the great love that you have for us and, and how you are with us every step of the way of our lives, guiding, reassuring, going before us and behind us, standing beside us, and holding our hand, rejoicing as we rejoice and feeling sorrow as we are sad. Great Father in heaven, how much we love you, how much we worship you, how much we are in awe of you and how much we are in gratitude of your love and your great mercy. We thank you for the enormous privilege of being able to stand in your presence and hold our heads up because we are forgiven and cleansed. We are sorry, Lord God, for the times when we fail you and we fail ourselves, when we don't see you at work, when we refuse to see you at work, when we turn the other way because we would rather do what we want to do even though we know that's not the right thing. So Father, we just lift those things which would come between you and us, we lift them to you and say that we are sorry, that we do want to live our lives your way and follow you more nearly. Forgive us, we pray, and restore us to be sons and daughters of the King of Heaven. In your name, we stand and we just bask in your love, in your power, in your strength. Amen. Amen. Here we are, coming to this quite interesting name. It was, it was interesting because I started reading about this um, right at the end of last week, this week, and I couldn't, I don't 
No. I couldn't feel that spark of what I was to say to you this morning. And I read it all, well, not, not all of it, because there's a rather a lot to read, but I read enough to get the flavor. But there was, there was just a spark that was missing. And I kept reading it and putting it to one side and thinking about it and going back and still nothing and still nothing. And then, as I thought about the events of the week that we have, that we have witnessed, it was when I started to think about those things in our world which aren't right, which aren't good, the suffering of, its, of God's people, uh, the suffering of the world. And it's when I started thinking about that that I began to see and understand more about this Hebrew name for God, Yahweh Sebiot. I struggled big time with pronouncing it, so I went on to various search engines. How do you pronounce it? And they all had a different way. And some of them I listened again and again and thought, can't actually hear what it is they're saying. It just sounded like a <laughs> so I thought, well, that was no good. So anyway, I'm going to call this is, uh, Yahweh Sidiet. Okay, and I'll probably say it differently as I go along, but that doesn't matter because what it means is the Lord of hosts. But it hosts, that's a bit of a funny word, isn't it? You know, it doesn't really mean necessarily that much. So you look back, look further down, and it comes from the word, the, the Soviet comes from the word Sava, which is the war, the army. And that gives us perhaps a little bit more of a clue. And Soviet is a plural form of army, of Sava, so it's war armies. Okay. And it's also written in Yehovah Sabbath or Yahweh Sabbath. And it's translated as the Lord of armies or the Lord of hosts. It's a word, Sava, was originally used in the book of Numbers by Moses and Aaron. And God tells them to set the men of Israel apart um, and for service to God. And there were going to be two categories. There were the Levites who were going to serve in the tabernacle. And there were going to be the other men. And there were lots of stipulations about their age and various things and how many. And they were going to serve God by being in his army. And that's where you see the word other army. You're going to be in God's army. All of the Israelite men, both the men of war and the men called to serve the Lord in worship, were commissioned by God to enter into his service. Why? In order to maintain peace and to protect the people. Those in the temple were battling on the spiritual side, and those who were in the army were going to be battling on the physical side. They were the ones going to be meeting in, in physical form the armies of the world to protect and to get the people of Israel into promised land. And you'd be, I'd be surprised to know, you may or may not, but Yahweh Sebiot is the most frequently used compound name of God in scripture. And it's used over 250, 300 times in the Old Testament, but only twice in the New Testament. It's not used throughout the whole Bible. Uh, it's used almost exclusively, not entirely, but almost exclusively in the books of the prophets or the Psalms. Particularly where a situation is dire and a particular person or the people of Israel are in extremes. And it's a term that encompasses God's sovereignty over all the spiritual and the physical armies. He is the Lord of hosts. The hosts are the multitudes in heaven and is in command of the multitude of heavenly beings to face all adversaries. Psalm 46 verses 10 to 11 tells, tells us to cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. So it's used by the psalmist uh, a lot of the time as he was crying out to God um, for help in times of trouble. So it's possibly not surprising that he's going to call upon 
the, uh, the, 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 the heavenly armies to help him. And, and all the prophets, they speak out to a nation which has forgotten who it is. That's what they're doing with. That's why they're there. The, the people of Israel have forgotten who they belong to. Um, they've abandoned their uniqueness as God's chosen people. And they ended up behaving just like all of their neighbors. And they look to other nations to save them and form alliances, but they're not looking to Yahweh. And at the time of the prophet Isaiah, Israel disobeyed God and was overrun by the Babylonian and the Assyrian Empire. And so it goes on. The people were suffering because they stopped loving Yahweh and Sabbath and began to do the wrong thing. But that same Lord of Sabbath is merciful. He would not wipe out Israel. He blessed the remnant who believed and protected them. And it was at this difficult time that God spoke to his prophet Isaiah. And in a moment, uh, Carol is going, Carol Dumbrell is going to come and uh, give us the first of our readings. And just some background. King Isaiah has died. And for the best part of 50 years, the country has enjoyed prosperity and success because the King Isaiah did what was right in the name of the Lord, and he was blessed by God. But there's a big but coming up. The end, the last years of his life, he seemed to step away from that, uh, and he did things out of his own pride, and he disobeyed God, and God punished him by making him have leprosy. And he was then in seclusion, so it was a very sad end to what was actually a great king. Um, and when he died, the forces of Babylon were there, circling like hungry wolves, ready to destroy Jerusalem and to take over. So you can imagine that this situation, the people have only enjoyed this peaceful, prosper, prosperous and blessed existence. Now their king's dead, the Babylonians are all around, what's gonna happen? Terrible fear all around, there's chaos and there's fear and uncertainty. And they're thinking to themselves, who's going to save us? And Carol is going to come down and come up and give us the first of our readings, which is from Isaiah chapter 6, 1 to 7. And while Carol's getting herself ready, um, this is a vision of God, which, I, which means a lot to me, but there's things out of this that I've, I've got this time rather than before. Uh, and it's a vision right at the beginning of uh, Isaiah's time as God's blessed and commissioned prophet. And he sees a vision of Yahweh Sabbath. Chapter six. Uh, uh, verses one to seven. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings with two wings that covered their faces, with two that covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Um. 
and sees a perhaps a picture of what an artist thinks that would look like with uh, Isaiah at the bottom and being in the temple and God's glory all around and the seraphim. So what is it that leads Isaiah to see and to, and to name Yahweh Sebiot in his vision? What is it about God that makes it perhaps different from some of the other attributes that we assign to God? God gave him this vision at the start of his, his ministry very powerful, powerful vision, and it was to change uh, Isaiah forever. It was to give, gave him confidence in what he was to say, and he had to stand up to adversity and to people not believing him uh, and to and seemingly his words making no difference. But after this, seeing this vision of God in his temple, a very, very profound experience, I think, for absolutely anybody, and who would not be changed forever if this is what they saw. He needed to see that God was glorious. He needed to see God was in his temple. And he needed to know quite a lot about this Lord of hosts, this God, this Lord of heaven's armies, who would be with him. Not only did the seraphim bring the burning coals from the altar and cleanse Isaiah from his sins so that he could stand in the temple and not be, uh, not fall down dead. But that profound experience that he has been anointed by God to be his spokesperson. This was going to have to uphold him and to strengthen him uh, throughout all his times as a prophet. What is it about this name, likewise, that should give us confidence in the God who saves us? Well, there are several truths about God in that, read, that reading, particularly those first three verses. I saw the Lord. He was sat, sitting on a mighty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces and with two, they covered their feet and with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The king, the Lord of heaven's armies, first of all, is. He is. He exists. He is there. Isaiah has seen him. And because he's Yahweh, the Lord of hosts is also eternal. The Lord of hosts is everlasting. And our God is Yahweh Sabaoth. And he is always there for us. Not only is he existing, and I've seen him in his temple, but he is on his, his throne in heaven. And everything about that vision speaks calm and order and peace and God's power. He is high and he's lifted up and he is in control just as he is always in control and he's there and he's ready to be called upon in times of need and is ready to make a difference his whole um with his robe filled the temple every part of him every part of that temple was filled with god's glory Later on, it says, where is it? Um, sorry. Holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Not only is the temple, is heaven filled with God's glory, but the whole earth is too. For he is everywhere. His whole presence fills the heavens and extends to the very ends of the earth. There is no place in heaven or on earth where God is not there. And God loves and protects his people wherever they are. 
And the seraphim were calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. For God is holy. And the Lord of hosts stands against those who are unrighteous and unholy. At the sight of the most holy God, Isaiah knew he was unworthy and he called out his repentance. And the other thing to know that this Lord of hosts is merciful to those who repent and offers forgiveness. And because of this vision, Isaiah now knows that God will look after him and care for him wherever he is called to go and whatever he is called to say in the name of Yahweh Zebiot. God loves and looks after his people, those who have true faith in him, those who he blesses. For our God is sovereign and he is on the throne forever. He was on the throne at the beginning of creation, the beginning of time. He was on the throne at the time of Moses. He was on the throne at the time of Jesus. He is on the throne as, our, as John Wesley and all the other people in the, in the, in the uh, 1700s began their, their um, part in the Great Commission. He is here now in 2021. He is on the throne and he will be on the throne forever and ever for the end of earth and when we are all in heaven. He is there. He is on the throne. He is eternal. And we can call on this God who is eternal in our time of need and he will make the difference. That's who the God of angel armies is. That's why we can call on him when, whenever and wherever we need. But the first place, the first place this name of God, Yahweh Sevia, is found in the Bible is in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And in spite of that vision I've just given to you, given to Isaiah at a time when the people of Israel were experiencing great uncertainty. They were about to be overrun by the Babylonians and were, everything around them was scary and uncertain and there was fear and everything else. So that you might think perhaps that that is the time when God acts, when, when his people are in dire need, as was the case time and time again with the, uh, with the other prophet, uh, prophets who called upon this name. But no, the first time that, this script, that the name of the Lord of hosts is found is in a situation of, that is deeply personal. And we have the next slide. I'm not going to read all of it. But this is the story of part of the story of Hannah, the mother of um, Samuel, and the story of how she came to be praying to God for a child. Um, his, her husband was called Elkanah, and he had two wives, Hannah and another called Peninnah. And here was the problem, you see, Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. And every year, this man would go from his own city to worship and sacrifice to Yahweh at Sabbath at Shiloh. And whenever he offered a sacrifice, he would give portions of it to his wife, Penaniah, and all of her sons and daughters, so she would have got quite a lot. And he gave one portion to Hannah because he loved her, even though Yahweh had kept her from having children. How does that not rub it in? <laughs> You're already feeling quite bad about it anyway. You're feeling that God has abandoned you and uh, you're, probably, you're having these children paraded before you. And then when you go to worship God at Shiloh once a year, you get this little bit and Hannah and all her, uh, 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 um, um, sorry, Penn and I and all her brood, they get some for everybody, you know? That really rubs it in. Okay. So Penaniah tormented her endlessly in order to make her miserable. And this happened year after year. Whenever Hannah went to Yahweh's house, Penaniah would make her miserable and Hannah would cry and not eat. Her husband Elkanah would ask her, Hannah, why are you crying? Why haven't you eaten? Why are you so downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? We're down at chapter nine, verse nine. And one day, one year, after Hannah had something to eat and drink in Shiloh, she got up. Though she was resentful, 
She prayed to Yahweh and she cried. And she made this vow. Yahweh Zaboeth, if you will look at my misery, remember me and give me a boy. And then I will give him to you for as long as he lives. A razor will never be used on his head. And while Hannah was praying a long time in front of Yahweh, the priest Eli was watching her mouth. She was praying silently and her voice couldn't be heard. Only her lips were moving. And you know the story how Eli thought she was drunk. And she says, no, I'm not drunk. I'm depressed. I'm pouring out my heart to Yahweh. Don't take me to be a good for nothing woman. I was praying like this because I have been troubled and tormented. And Eli replied, go in peace and may the Elohim of Israel God grant your request. You can just hear and you can feel Hannah's suffering in that reading. And from out of that intense personal suffering, from out of her extremists, she directs her prayer to the Lord of hosts. She believes in God. She is faithful to God. And no doubt she has prayed to God, to Yahweh, for years and years and years to give her a child. But none have arrived. And she reaches that point of utter desperation. And she calls on the name of the Lord of hosts. Bring heaven's armies and change my situation. Please, dear God. She was in a helpless and a hopeless situation. But surely she had to wonder where was God in the midst of her years of loneliness and shame. And reaching that make or break point, she could do things, two things. She could pine away through depression or she could call upon the Lord of hosts who is on his throne and is the commander in chief of the spiritual armies in heaven. She could call on him to hear her prayer and answer her plea. And the Lord God heard Hannah's prayer and he accept, accepted her vow and he granted her request and he blessed her beyond her imaginings. Hannah would go on to have a baby, the prophet Samuel, one of the first prophets and one of the greatest prophets that Israel would know. For God is in control and God fights for his people. And then the next time the name is used, it's also in 1 Samuel. It's in the, used in the story of David and Goliath, where David fought with Goliath and the Philistine army in, in the name and power of Yahweh, Sebiot, the Lord of armies. Our next one. Sorry, that was the Lord of, sorry, Hannah, there's a picture. That I'll, it's just, so it's reading the picture, okay? And this one, again, is quite a long one, so I'm just going to read you little bits of it. So you can, hopefully we all know and we can remember that story of uh, David and Goliath. And, and this is part of it. Saul, he's gone to Saul and offered to fight. Uh, and, uh, they, and, and says, he can't. Uh, Saul responded, you can't fight this Philistine. You're just a boy. He's been a warrior since he was your age. And then David replied to Saul, I'm a shepherd for my father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. If it attacked me, I took hold of its mane, struck it, and killed it. I have killed lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has challenged the army, army of Elohim Shev. David added, it was Yahweh who saved me from the lion and the bear, and he will save me from this Philistine. So David takes his, he, he says, forget about the armor, I don't know what I'm doing in those. He takes a stick and smooth stones and his shepherd's bag and his sling. And you know the story of how he approaches the Philistine. The Philistines ask David, am I a dog that you come to attack me with sticks? So the Philistine called on his gods to curse David. Come on, the Philistine told David, and I'll give your body to the birds. And this is the thing. David said to the Philistine, you come with me, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I, I come to you in the name of Yahweh Sebaoth, the Elohim of the army of Israel, whom you have insulted. Today, Yahweh will hand you over to me, 
and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And this day, I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. The whole world will know that Israel has an Elohim. And then everyone gathered here will know that Yahweh can save without sword or spear, because Yahweh determines every battle's outcome. He will hand all of you over to us. And there he is, Elohim, Yahweh Sabbath, the Lord of Arms. The previous slide showed the Lord of Hosts, which is perhaps a slightly more gentler version for Hannah to see. God, you see, had rejected King Saul. That's 1 Samuel 15, verse 28, and was no longer with him in power. His army, the army of Israel, had forgotten who their true commander was. And when they saw the might of the Philistines and the champion, they were dismayed and disheartened and scared. But what Saul didn't know was that David was now God's anointed one and that he was filled with God's spirit. We read that in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. David did not see Goliath as a giant, but as a mortal man who had defied the almighty God. There was a physical battle which David fought, but David knew that he could only be victorious with the armies of the Lord. The Lord fought for David, and the Lord gave David and the armies of Israel a great victory that day. David knew there was power in the name of Yahweh Sabiat. Not that it was a magical name, but he knew that name represented something that he could depend on. And like David, we need to understand and proclaim the name and power of the God whom we know. There is true victory in this life, physically and spiritually, in the Lord alone. He alone is our victorious leader, and he alone brings salvation to his people. The battles we will face on this earth will take their various forms. And we need to know our God well in every situation and fight that battle in the power and strength that he provides. There will be times when we will have to stand up to the enemy, as David did, in full faith to see the victory of the Lord. But there will be other times when all we can do is pour out our heart to God in prayer. Because we are too ashamed to even talk about our heart, our pain to, to others, as Hannah did. In either case, we need to remember that one of the names of God is Adonai Zebiot, the Lord of Arms. And in this name is supreme authority over all other powers, even nature itself. There is no magic in using this name, but there is supernatural power in the God who bears this name. How we need to know Adonai Sebiot intimately. And in doing that, the Lord of Heaven's armies will be with us and we can change the world in his name. Amen. As I said at the beginning, I couldn't get that real handle on the passion and the extremists and the real feeling that go with calling upon the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, until we just move on. Thank you. I was kept thinking about this song. Um, it kept coming to me over and over again, and we will be singing it at the end. Because we can say that I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind me. Who is he? He's the God of angel armies, and he's there always by my side. He is the one who reigns forever. And actually, he's a friend of mine. And the God of angel armies is always by my side. And that's the, that's the message that I want you to leave with today in that song that the God of angel armies is there with you, by your side, fighting your battles with you. 
and he will prevail because he is the Lord of hosts and he is God Almighty. Let me make some and then we'll make so. so I said at the beginning that it was events of this week that led me to sort of understand and to feel what it is to call upon the name of Yahweh said it. And those of you who've looked recently at your emails will know that we have sent out as leadership team um, three requests uh, for, for people in dire need, in peril. And these are part of them. And we, first of all, we, we all know the dreadful suffering following the earthquake and this tropical storm in Haiti and how people have lost everything. Uh, and hundreds of people or thousands have died and lost their homes and everything else. And then here is some part, I'll read some of this for you. There's a lot there. Uh, so we have had a request from Tear Fund uh, to pray for them. Uh, they were there because their, their church partners are there. They're part of the community. They were there when this happened. Uh, and they asked us to pray for the local partners that they can continue to offer the help most needed and for the families affected that they can recover in the days and weeks to come. And there is a video from that uh, Mark Antoine um, on one of the links. And this is part of a, a letter sent to Kath as, as a child sponsor, uh, telling us about the impact of this earthquake on, on their local work in Haiti. And it says that um, 46 of the 92 local church projects report serious damage. Um, we know that 15 of our local church projects have seen buildings destroyed that will need to be rebuilt with more likely to be damaged beyond repair. The uh, all 96 projects altogether, they serve more than 17,000 children, which is quite an amazing number. And they are urgently checking on the well-being of each of these children, what a mammoth task, and their families. And they've said to Kath that we are aware that one of your ch children you sponsor attends one of these 92 projects. Uh, and and there, there's assurance that they will let her know um, about the fate of that child once they have it appertained. And they say it's with heavy hearts that they report that 10 children supported by Compassion are known to have died, as well as at least seven caregivers. The Compassion Project has still seen real, real loss of this difficult time. Uh, and they ask for joint help, join me in prayer with strength, peace and comfort to the families. At this time, we don't know the names of the children who've been injured or died in this disaster, but we will contact sponsors with any news as soon as they have it. And the next one, Hannah. Another <coughs> big event that's happening and unfolding on our television screen is Afghanistan. Uh, and this was uh, um, prayers that were requested uh, by Open Doors. Uh, and uh, this is Brother Samuel, that's not his real name, and he asks for our prayers. And he says, and this really, I think, brings it home, the cost as it is to be a Christian in lots of places of the world. These are uncertain times for Christians in Afghanistan. It's absolutely dangerous. We don't know what the next month will bring, what kind of implementation of Sharia law we will see, but we continue to ask you to intercede for our brothers and sisters. They are facing insurmountable adversity, and we must pray without ceasing. And then he adds, secret believers in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, and they have to be secret believers, um, are, especially, are especially vulnerable. Prior to Taliban rule, they already had a very difficult time living out their faith, as they had to keep it secret from their families for fear of being shunned or worse killed. Now that the Taliban is in power, their vulnerability increases tenfold. It would be almost impossible to be a follower of Jesus in this country. A horrible statement. We are monitoring the situation, but this is the time for us to ask, to ask God to have mercy, not only on his people, the Christians there, but on this country as a whole. And as, as I read all of those that I began to see, why it is, that the prophets called out and why Hannah and why David called out on the name of Yahweh Sadiat to answer their prayers, to be with them and to, uh, and to fight their battles because it's a battle that they cannot win on their own. 
So I'm going to invite you to just turn to the person next to you or in little groups of three, you don't need to move your chair, just sort of angle yourselves. And we're going to pray together for these two places, for Haiti and for Afghanistan, for the work of Tear Fund and the work of Compassion, and for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan mm -hmm. who are suffering and uh, whose very existence is in dark, they are in dire need and they are in peril of their lives. And Hannah, if you can move on, thank you. So that's a summary of those prayers. Uh, at the bottom, we've talked, um, you can see that they are what the prayers and the prayers of the open doors prayers are prayed for small groups of believers in this country that they find strength, wisdom, and supernatural power, peace in God's promises. Pray for the displaced, pray for the women, and pray for the sick. Um, COVID cases apparently are spiking in the country as the Delta uh, variant is taking hold and hospitals are limited in what they can offer and pray that the healthcare system will not uh, collapse. And the last prayer, pray that the country will not be a haven for extremists. So we're going to take some time now and uh, invite the people at home um, to pray either on your own or if, you're, if you are there with, um, with somebody else then to pray together. Um, for these people who are in dire need. They are in peril of their lives and they have great need of Yahweh <coughs> and Shaviot to come in all his power and to rescue them and to deliver them from their adversity. So we'll spend five minutes in prayer. Just sort of just sort of angle yourselves. I know it's more tricky, but angle yourselves towards other people. So that you can pray together um, uh, for the situation. <laughs> Thank you. 
to finish that time of intercessory prayer for these people who are in dire need and peril. Just a closing prayer for them. Today we cry out to you, Jehovah Sabwek, for the people of Haiti and Afghanistan, and for all believers in the world who are in dire need and peril. We acknowledge our and their need of you, that they are desperate for your help, even as Hannah was desperate for your help and deliverance. We cry to you to answer these our prayers and for them, even as you hear and answer their own prayers. May we all stand firm in your promises and know that because of your great love, none of us who serve you need be consumed by our situation and that your loving compassion never fail us. For God, you alone make the impossible possible. You alone calm the raging storm, and you alone are our refuge. For you are the God of angel armies, and you are there, right by our side. Amen. And we come to uh, our final song, which uh, I know that Ian has uh, put in God of angel armies. So let's stand to sing.
certain knowledge that the God of angel armies stands by your side, that he goes before you and that he stands behind. Go out filled with the courage and compassion of Jesus, strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit to serve God wherever and to whosoever he leads you. And we go in the name of Christ to love and to serve the world. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.